Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Reborn Muslim, the podcast by and for reverts to Islam. I'm your host Avalon and today I want to talk about creating a more welcoming space for reverts in the Muslim community, whether it's at masjids or wherever it may be. Here are some things that I want us to focus on um, and specifically things I want us to avoid going forward so that we can make our revert brothers and sisters feel more comfortable. This is obviously mostly aimed at born Muslims because the things I'll be mentioning are usually things that born Muslims will ask reverts or will say to reverts. However, it's not only born Muslims that do this. Sometimes it's reverts themselves who have been Muslim for some time now, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, however it might be. Um, they start to have some of the tendencies that some of these like more judgmental born Muslims have. And um, so I'm saying that more judgmental because not all born Muslims do this. And also you might have said something that I'm mentioning today to a revert before and you're not even a judgmental person at all. Maybe you're not even that kind of person. So I don't want to pass judgment on anyone. However, I'm just asking everyone to kind of take a step back and reflect and going forward to avoid asking these things. Another thing I'll say is that um, I know reverts who will say, oh, I don't care if someone asks me these things with certain uh, things I'll mention today. They'll say, oh, they can ask me that all they want, you know. That's fine, but from my experience and the majority of other reverts that I've spoken to, their experiences, um, these are insulting and, and, you know, sometimes just plain rude. And um, at very least, it's uncomfortable and it just makes for a, yeah, an unwelcoming environment, somewhere that we don't want to be. A lot of times this is at the masjid and we don't want to create that kind of space, the masjid, where people are uncomfortable and they don't want to come back. The last thing I want to mention before we actually get started with this episode and finally get on with it is that some of these things I'll be mentioning today are ridiculous. Like a lot of people will hear them and think, I can't believe anybody would ever say that to anyone. Like I just can't fathom that somebody would be that rude or intrusive or whatever it is. However, that's okay to be baffled by it. You know, that can be a good thing because that can be the impetus for change, right? Because some people will hear that you know, they'll, they'll hear these kind of experiences and they'll say, I can't believe this has happened to you. You know, we need to be better in this community. We need to not let these things happen going forward. And we need to not say these things going forward. And other people will say, I can't believe that's happened to you. You see what I'm saying? You see the difference that it's like, I straight up don't believe you. Like, I think you're making that up or I think you're exaggerating or yeah, they just like don't believe that it happened to us. And in some cases, it's just literally gaslighting, like they're just telling us they don't believe us um, and making us question our experiences. But sometimes it's actually coming from a good place because that person just, they don't have it in them to ever do something like that. You know what I mean? I think we've all heard someone say something terrible or hear of an experience, something terrible that happened. And we're just like having a hard time comprehending it. Not because we don't believe the person who's talking about it. It's just like, I can't imagine why anyone would ever do that. So you see what I'm saying? Some people really have good intentions when they when they say, I, I just can't believe that, you know, and they're having a hard time coming to grips with the fact that this is a widespread issue. Um, it's not coming from a bad place. I would say a, like majority of the time, they're not trying to gaslight us or make us feel like we're making it up. They just are really having a hard time um, imagining it because they would never do that. However, what I would ask you before we get started is to not let that, you know, shock at these, the fact that these things really happen, not let that shock frame uh, the reality that, that these things do happen. So hopefully that makes sense that like, don't let that shock of like, wow, I can't believe people really say that. Don't let it get to the point where it's like, yeah, I I just don't believe that because sometimes it does. Um, And people again will kind of gaslight us on our experiences and make us feel like we're lying. So definitely try not to be judgmental. Um, I'm going to try not to be judgmental as well. Please try to approach this with an open mind and remember that the experiences of reverts are inherently different than the experiences of born Muslims. We have so much in common, most things in common. However, we're going to have experiences that just that born Muslims never had. That's just the reality. So um, yeah, with all that being said, finally, let's get started with the episode. Bismillah. Okay, so the first thing I'll mention um, of things that I would advise us not to ask reverts about, probably first and foremost, is their past. So literally anything from before they were Muslim 
or even when they first converted, honestly, like just their past in general. A lot of these things are going to be common sense. Like, would you ask a born Muslim this? Would you ask a random person on the street this? No, then don't ask reverts. And so you'd think the common sense still applies when they're speaking to a revert, but somehow people, honestly, they I feel like they don't maybe respect us in the same way, or they're just so curious that they feel entitled to ask invasive and personal and extremely rude questions. However, that's not, it's not enough. That's not appropriate. So if you're speaking to a revert, please don't bring up their past. Please don't ask about things. Please don't pry about things, you know, and try to figure out what they got up to. Oh, did you drink? Did you smoke? Did you date? Or even just like not specific things like not, oh, did you participate in haram? Just in general, like what were you doing before? What were you like before? Um, I know people are curious, but just because you're curious does not mean you deserve an answer. It, it really doesn't. And in fact, that's actually discouraged in Islam to talk about your sins. Even if it was before you were Muslim and they weren't even, you know, you weren't even thinking of these things as bad because you weren't Muslim at all. Um, why would you bring that up? Why would you try to bring that out of a person to tell them about or to tell you about the bad things they've done or just in general their life before Islam? We don't want to do that. And especially for a lot of us, we might have been going through an incredibly difficult time right before we converted. Um, I know I definitely was and a lot of other people were as well before they found Islam. And Islam was a thing that saved them and changed their life so much for the better. So, um, yeah, so for, a, a, you know, a million reasons, just please do not ask about anyone's past, but also don't ask about Reaver's past. Okay, next thing that I would advise you not to ask about is basically like their story, how they came to Islam, why they came to Islam for the same reason that I just mentioned. So a lot of times people end up converting after a very traumatic experience or after a life-threatening, life-changing experience, trauma that they've gone through, something terrible happens and then they have to like reevaluate their life. You know what I'm saying? And not always, not like sometimes it's like a totally like easygoing story and that's you know, no trauma is involved at all. However, how would you know that? You see what I'm saying? How would you know that it's going to be that kind of story? So just avoid it. Honestly, just avoid the question. I've talked about this publicly many times. You don't deserve an answer. You really don't. Just because you're curious does not mean that you deserve an answer. I'm sorry to tell you that. I know that a lot of people feel entitled. They feel emboldened to ask these things and they, they think that they deserve an answer just because they're Muslim, I guess. I don't really know you don't deserve an answer because this is a very personal thing and some people will open up and talk about their story and I've done that in the past. However, I avoid talking about my story now publicly because I've realized it's a very personal thing and, and I don't know anyone, you know, an explanation. I don't need to tell anybody that and nobody should be asking, frankly, it's really not your business. So please don't ask that. Again, I know people are curious and they say, oh, well, it boosts my amen and this and that. That's fine, but it really it's really not your place to ask. And another thing to keep in mind, this is like a really important point, is that if the person was comfortable enough with you to tell you their story to Islam or their, you know, their journey to Islam, like how they ended up here, they would have told you already. I promise you they would have already brought it up. They would have been casual about it and mentioned it, you know, um, they, they wouldn't have been shy to tell you. So if you're asking this question, it already shows that you're not close enough with this person to receive the information. They would have told you if they wanted to tell you. That's a natural thing that comes up in any conversation with a revert and another Muslim, whether it's a fellow revert or a born Muslim. Um, if you have a, a close friendship, that's going to come up. All of my close friends, we've talked about this before. You know, my reverts and born Muslim friends, like we've always, we've talked about my story before. It naturally will come up over time. So if they haven't already brought it up to you, it means that you're not close enough, let alone if they're a stranger. That's the crazy part is that I'll see this happening online a lot. People will just ask a revert, like, just because they make content for reverts, they think they're entitled to know exactly how they converted and, like, their whole story. And they'll ask them, like, you know, and they'll ask me, how did you convert? Tell me your story. I want to know your story. You don't need to know. It's none of your business, to be honest, and you need to have some emotional maturity and understand that you can't ask strangers personal information. Again, it might be a very traumatic story. They might have experienced a lot of hardship leading up to converting to Islam because, as I've said a million times, you don't convert to Islam in a country like America for no reason. 
you know, something happened, either good or bad, whatever it might have been, alhamdulillah, for, for the, you know, journey that you got, the journey that brought you to Islam. However, something big probably happened in your life to make you end up there. So please don't ask. Along with that, kind of like a related, you know, sort of like a piece of the story, um, people will often ask, how did your family react? Like, I want to hear about how your family reacted. How did they, how did they take it? What did they say? Did they get mad? Again, this is not something that you should be asking a stranger. This just shows a level of, uh, you know, emotional immaturity, in my opinion. And it shows that, you know, maybe you don't understand all social norms or boundaries because that's just not something you ask someone that's not normal. It's like there's so many people I've met who, for example, who are, you know, part of the LGBT community. Let's say they're gay. I've never heard someone say, how did your parents react when you came out to them? That is, that's a crazy thing to ask someone. So I don't understand why that is like not something that's acceptable to say nowadays. But then when it comes to reverts, people can say, oh, how did your parents react? And I'm not trying to legitimize the LGBT movement. I'm not trying to say um, that it's the same thing, converting to Islam and coming out as gay. Not at all. However, what I'm saying is even coming out as gay has the level of respect of like, you know, you don't ask someone what their parents did or how their family reacted. People know that, but somehow people don't know, hey, maybe don't ask a revert how their family reacted. You see what I'm saying? It's like, why? Why do people think that it's appropriate to ask this? It's not appropriate. So um, again, it might have been a very traumatic experience. You know, there's people who whose family completely rejects them. There's people whose family tries to hurt them physically. There's people whose family psychologically abuses them after they convert who kicks them out of the house and makes them homeless. There's people whose families will, um, you know, kind of like smear their name and lie about them and try to make them look bad because they just see them as not one of their own anymore. There's so much hardship and trauma that can come with reverting to Islam, not from Islam, but from the reception of your conversion from friends and family, from the people you're, you're around. So it's extremely inappropriate to ask someone this question because, again, you're essentially asking a stranger about trauma. That's completely inappropriate and we should know this by now. Okay, next question that I think literally every revert ever has received, at least every female revert, um, maybe a lot of male reverts too, but pretty much every female revert that I know has received this question at some point or another. You probably already know. If you're a revert, you already know what I'm about to say. Did you do it for a man? Did you do it for a woman? Did you do it to get married, etc.? Basically trying to attribute your choice to convert to anything other than your own brain and intellect. <laughs> That's why I say this mostly happens with women. Be I mean, because it does. That's why I say it. But I think the reason it mostly happens with women is because people see, first of all, people see women as lesser than. Even people in the West who want to talk about women's rights, they see women as objects and they see them as lesser than. And um, that, like they don't have their own brain. That's the first thing. The second thing, people see Islam as a woman, you know, a woman hating religion, like a, a religion that degrades and belittles the value of, of women. So those things combined, a lot of people will say, you know, did you convert for a man? Because they can't comprehend that you would just actually believe in Islam and make this choice for yourself. So it's like when it comes from non-Muslims, it, it sucks. It's annoying. It's a stereotype. However, when it comes from fellow Muslims, that's when it's really shocking to me that it's like, wow, guys, like we're just playing into the stereotypes that Americans are making about us now. You know what I mean? Like that's that's pretty bad. You know, like that's pretty disappointing to see that coming from from fellow Muslims. And this happens a lot. They'll say like, oh, well, you just converted for a man like you're not you, you don't really believe in Islam. Like you're not really a good Muslim. First of all, how would you know that? How could you possibly know that? Are you Allah? No. So you don't know her intentions. You don't know how she ended up here. It doesn't matter if she's married to a Muslim man. People like adopt habits and interests from their partner all the time. And no one ever says it's bad. But then all of a sudden, if you adopt your religion from your partner, now it's illegitimate and you're not a real, you're not a real Muslim. You see what I'm saying? Like how many people do we know that never were interested in a certain thing before they got married and their partner is interested in that thing and now they are as well. That's just normal. It's a person that you probably trust in the world more than anyone. You spend the most time with them more than anyone. 
and you love them and admire them. So of course you're going to learn from them and be interested in the things they're interested in and then perhaps take take off and do that thing all on your own as well. That's not no, like weird. <laughs> it's not hard to figure out. So that's why it's so crazy when people will be like, oh, you had to have converted for, your, for a man. Like just because someone is married to a Muslim man and, you know, maybe she was married to him before converting or she converted right before they got married. You don't know the full picture. That's the first thing. The second thing, again, when it comes from fellow Muslims that bothers me so much is like, do you not think that Islam is a perfect religion? Do you not think that it's something people would want to convert to? Do you think that it's only, you know, the people who are born into the religion, those are the only ones who really practice it and nobody would want to be interested in it other than them? If that's what you think about Islam, you should really reevaluate your um, your knowledge of Islam. Honestly, you should really take a step back and wonder, what am I doing? What am I doing as a Muslim? What do I believe? What don't I believe? Because if you think your religion sucks and nobody would convert to it, why are you a part of it? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like we all know, all of us as Muslims know that Islam is perfect and it's beautiful and it naturally appeals to people because it's the truth. So why would you ever question why someone would convert? That's crazy to me. So please never ask that question. It's just, it <laughs> blows my mind that Muslims will ask this question. So the last question that I'll go over that we should avoid is when are you going to, you know, insert the voluntary act? So let me give you some examples. When are you going to change your name? You know, change it to a Muslim name, to an Arabic name. Here's another example. When are you going to learn Arabic? So there's a ton of these. There's so much to unpack here. So let's first talk about vol the, the voluntary acts, right? So not obligatory things, things that you can choose to do if you want. When people ask, when are you going to change your name? It blows my mind because that is such a massive life change. And so for someone to come in and say, when are you going to change it? Also, your family gave you that name and they probably spent quite a bit of time thinking about it and it might have a lot of significance to your family. And for them to, for someone to come in and say, when are you going to change it? Even if you say, if, you know, like, are you going to change it ever? It's, first of all, again, it's none of your business. That's not a question that you should be asking someone. And secondly, we don't have to change it. That's not an obligation on us. So for people to say, when are you going to change it? It's extremely pr presumptuous and it's rude. And it's, it's, um, it makes reverts have anxiety. At least it would give me anxiety when people would ask me that because I'm thinking I am literally trying so hard to be a good Muslim. I have given up almost everything in my life, my entire lifestyle. I've given up so many friendships. I've given up the respect of my family to a, a great extent. I've given up so much and I've gone through so much to be where I am today. And you're telling me it's not enough because I haven't changed my name. I have to do that too. Like when I first heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, like I don't want to change my name because I thought it was something that I had to do. And then I realized, oh no, I don't have to do it. It's a voluntary thing if I want to. And then I just got really annoyed that anybody would ever ask me such a question. It's voluntary. It's not something we have to do. And it causes pressure and anxiety and so many negative feelings to ask somebody that. Please do not ask someone that. With the example of, are you going to learn Arabic? Of course, as Muslims, we should all learn Quranic Arabic. Of course we should. Absolutely. However, first of all, people will ask this question like, when are you going to learn to speak Arabic? People have asked me that. And once again, it is not a requirement of Islam. That's not a requirement of being a Muslim to be able to have a conversation in Arabic. I'm not becoming Arab, I'm becoming Muslim. You know what I'm saying? Secondly, to read Quranic Arabic so that we can actually read the Quran rather than in translation is a great thing. And that's something that we should all strive for. 100%, I agree with that. However, asking in that kind of context of when are you going to learn, once again, it causes anxiety. It's like one more thing to add on the list of things that we're already struggling with. These things come with time. Asking someone like that and being presumptuous and forceful will only create like hurt feelings it will make us feel burnt out and with a lot of reverts it'll make them feel like they're never going to be good enough so why are they even trying at all that's how it makes a lot of people feel it's really inappropriate and we need to stop doing this going forward another thing i'd like to mention is that i know plenty of born muslims who do not speak a word of arabic who cannot read arabic at all and somehow i don't see people asking them so when are you going to learn arabic 
And I'm sure people do, don't get me wrong. However, it's weird to me that like the immediate response when you talk to a revert with a lot of people is, oh, have you learned Arabic yet? When are you going to learn Arabic? And yet I don't see them asking the same thing to born Muslims. It's something that has to happen over time. And we can't take everything all at once. That's why when you look at the Quran, you know, all the rulings that came out, um, don't drink, don't have premarital sex, don't do this and that, like all the things we're not supposed to do as Muslims, they're supposed to avoid. Um, they came out in stages. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has so much wisdom beyond what we have. And the wisdom behind that is it came out in stages so that people could actually adjust. You know, it would be like, oh, try to avoid this. Okay, now it's completely forbidden. Okay, now try to avoid this thing. Okay, now it's forbidden. You see what I'm saying? Like it came in stages. And in fact, there's even a hadith, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. It's a very famous hadith. Um, please look into it if you want more details. But Aisha mentioned that, you know, if the first ruling that came out was you have to give up alcohol, like just straight away, everyone give up alcohol, um, it would be much harder. I don't remember exactly what the hadith was, but, you know, basically nobody would be able to do that because it's a huge change all at once. So that's why it shows the wisdom behind why things came out in stages. So somehow people forget that and they treat us reverts like we need to figure everything out right away and be perfect right away. And yet they're not holding their children, to be honest, they're not holding them to the same standard. And they're not holding other born Muslims to the same standard. It's really mind-blowing to me. So please do not ask these kind of questions. Even if it is something that's obligatory, it's not voluntary like the hijab. I think we all know hijab is a requirement for women and men, but for in different ways. Uh, but specifically with the headscarf, people will say to reverts, you know, when are you going to start wearing hijab? And I feel like they ask born Muslims that as well. Honestly, like born Muslim women who don't wear the hijab, I feel like they'll ask them that as well. Um, so this applies to both. The thing you need to keep in mind here is, let's just take a step back. Do you think they know hijab is an obligation? I'm going to go with yes. <laughs> Because advising is super important, right? Like we need to be able to advise each other. We need to know when to offer each other advice and, and try to guide each other on the straight path and also receive advice, be receptive and humble enough to receive advice from our brothers and sisters. That's very important. And that is a part of our tradition as Muslims. However, sometimes people will offer quote unquote advice and it's not really advice. It's just judgment that they're passing because it makes them feel better about themselves. So when you're giving quote unquote advice that you need to start wearing hijab or when are you going to start wearing hijab, think about it logically. Do you really think they didn't know that they're supposed to wear hijab? Do you really think you're the first person to bring this up to them? Do you really think in a country that, like America where hijab is constantly talked about as oppressive and even non-Muslims, the one thing they know about Islam is the hijab? Do you really think they didn't know about hijab? Of course not. Of course they know hijab. Of course they know that they're supposed to be wearing it. So you coming in and saying, so when are you going to wear it? That helps absolutely nothing. That literally, again, it just causes anxiety and it causes them to feel bad. Make dua for them, pray for them, that they will be guided and be able to wear it. But please do not go up and say, when are you going to start wearing hijab? And be judgmental like that because it literally does nothing. It, If anything, it just causes the girl to feel further from from hijab from embracing hijab because then if she did go and do it she would just be doing it because she's pressured and not for the right reasons and i guarantee if you do if she did that she's not going to keep it on she's going to take it off at some point so just in general let's not ask these questions of born muslims or reverts but this is definitely something that reverts deal with on a regular basis okay and the last thing i want to mention is not a question it's more of a statement that i get sometimes um quite a bit actually and there's many different variations of this but essentially it's i'm jealous of you or i wish i reverted or whatever it might be it's like some variation of like i wish i was in your position again <laughs> Let's unpack that. So first of all, this is very problematic because it makes it seem as though you're not appreciative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan for all of us, for you and for me. It makes it seem like you know better. You don't know better than Allah. And I'm not saying you do or you think you do, um, but I'm saying that's what you're starting to get at. That's what you're approaching when you start saying, I wish I had reverted. I wish I had your story. I wish I, you know, I'm jealous of you and I wish I was in the same situation as you. To be honest, if I'm just being frank with you, of a lot of the born Muslims I've encountered in this day and age, 
If they were not born into Islam, they would have never come to Islam. I'm just being honest with you. The way a lot of born Muslims act, they're ho- they're hardly holding on to Islam even as Muslims. So if they were not born as Muslims, you know, in, again, a country like America or a non-Muslim country, and they weren't born into a Muslim family, I can almost promise you they would have never converted. So the fact that you're being so presumptuous to say, I wish I reverted, I wish I had the story, I'm jealous of you because you have a special status because you're a revert. Do you think you know better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of everything, the best of planners? You think you know better, really? Do you think that you you are so sure that if you were born a non-Muslim, you would have reverted? How could you know that? How could you possibly know that? How could you question Allah's wisdom? Because frankly, as I already mentioned, you might have never converted if you were born a non-Muslim. If you were born in a non-Muslim environment, chances are you would have never converted. So it's very, very presumptuous for you to say, I wish I was you know, in your situation. And it's also kind of insinuating that Allah is not the most just, which we all know he is. He's the most just, more just than any of us could be. When you say, you know, oh, I want to be revert because I want special status or whatever. Do you think we just get undue special status or something? Do you think we're just treated like different than the rest of Muslims? Like we're more privileged or something in the eyes of Allah and Allah loves us more or something? No, it's like, what kind of Muslim are you? Are you practicing? Are you doing what you need to be doing? Then you honestly, you would never say that. I've never met a Muslim who's very practicing, who's on their deen and puts Islam first in their life and is very conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has said something like this. I wish I reverted. I'm jealous of you. They've never said that because they know they're doing what they need to be doing and they're right with Allah. So if you feel that way, if you feel like you wish you reverted, you're probably not in a very good situation with your faith, to be quite honest, because why, like, why should you feel that way? Why should you have reverted to get some special status, quote unquote, or get your sins taken away? Why don't you work harder on that? Don't, don't wish that you were going through what I was going through. And that brings me to the second a problem with this statement. The thing that hurts the reverts the most, I would say, is that it really invalidates our feelings and experiences for you to say, I'm jealous of you, because essentially what you're saying is, I'm jealous of the trauma that you experienced through becoming a Muslim. Again, it's not that the trauma came from Islam, and alhamdulillah for our journeys, alhamdulillah for anything that brought us to Islam, you know, at the end of the day, it was the right path because it brought us to Islam, like whatever we had to go through, even if it was terrible, it was all worth it to be Muslim. However, A lot of us have gone through really, really difficult trials through our conversion to Islam. We've gone through a lot of trauma and hardship and heartbreak and just a lot of pain. And so for you to just say, oh, I wish I went through that. It's a slap in the face, to be honest. It is really, it really, really hurts because it makes it seem like our hardships don't matter. It's like, oh, I wish I went through that. You know what I mean? Imagine someone saying like, I wish I went through the same trauma as you. What? that's so hurtful. That's so strange. Like, I just don't understand why people would say that. So again, please avoid saying that you're jealous of reverts. Um, Just in general, it's not good to tell someone you're jealous of them. You should always be remembering, you know, however their life ended up. It's as Allah wills. That's why we say mashallah. Um, Always try to have that in your mind and have that mindset. And uh, please don't invalidate our feelings that way. Okay, so basically this just ended up as a vent sesh. I'm sorry if I came off too strong at some point in this episode. Um, You know, I didn't mean to be harsh or unkind. However, these are some really hurtful things that people ask of reverts that create a very unwelcoming space, whether it be at a masjid or whether it be, you know, just one-on-one. You know, if you're a fellow Muslim that goes to school with them or goes to, you know, you work together, whatever it might be. It really creates an unwelcoming space and it creates a space that reverts don't want to come back to, frankly. When every time they go to the masjid, they're asked these kind of questions or even if they're asked one of these questions once at the masjid, they might not want to go back because they don't want to face this kind of reliving of their trauma if that's what they went through or anxiety of, you know, asking these invasive questions and pushing and pushing. When are you going to do this? When are you going to do that? Nobody wants to feel that way. We should all push ourselves to be better and we should all advise each other when necessary. However, a lot of these things are not either of those. It's just being intrusive. It's just being unkind. 
And sometimes I think it does come from jealousy. As I mentioned with the last thing, people feel jealous of reverts because they think that we have this, you know, wonderful status that we're like never going to sin again or something. I really don't get it. Um, we're just normal Muslims at the end of the day. Yes, our sins are wiped clean when we start. However, we're going to sin again. That's just the real reality of the situation. So um, I think it's very strange that people are so jealous. And again, I think that's a personal issue that they have to work on. However, these questions have real life consequences. That's why I wanted to talk about this, not just to rant. Maybe it was a rant and I got some things off my chest that have been bugging me for a while. Um, however, I wanted to bring this up so that we can create more welcoming spaces, particularly at the masjid, at you know spaces where Muslims are supposed to convene and worship Allah together and have community. Um, we shouldn't be making it a hostile environment and we shouldn't be putting anyone off like that. Uh, whether it be a revert or a born Muslim, as I mentioned with a lot of these things, um, they affect born Muslims too when you ask, you know, again, when are you going to, or when are you going to start wearing hijab or this or that? Please don't do these things. Please don't. We need to be better. We need to be less pushy and invasive with these kind of questions. We need to have some emotional maturity. Um, that's definitely something that we can learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I feel like he had a very, obviously, he had a very mature way of dealing with people um, and a very humble and eloquent way of guiding and advising people. And we need to learn from his his uh, legacy. We need to not forget the example he set for us. And um, yeah, I just think that this is important to talk about, that we need to make a space for reverts. We need to be more kind, not just to reverts, but to everyone, to, to fellow Muslims, um, whether they're born or converted. So that's all I wanted to talk about today. Thank you for listening <laughs> to my rant and hanging out with me. Um, inshallah, this, you know, kind of struck a chord with you, whether it's because you've asked these questions in the past or because you're a revert and you've experienced it or because you're a born Muslim and you've experienced it or you've just heard these things happening, whatever it may be. Um, hopefully this kind of makes you think. And inshallah, we can make more welcoming spaces in our masjids and, you know, Muslim communities going forward if we all make the effort. So again, thank you so much for listening and I'll see you again very soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.